Good evening, everyone. My name is Vince Furpo. I am the Vice President for Public Engagement here at the Newberry Library. And I would like to start this program, as I start many of our programs, by thanking you all for being here this evening. Whether you are joining us live in the room or one of the hundreds of people who are joining us via live stream, uh, we are very grateful for your participation with the library. If you are here in the room, I would ask that you please just take a quick moment to make sure that your cell phone or other electronic devices are on silent mode. Tonight marks the first event in our Writers on Writing series, although we did have a little bit of a sneak peek back in the spring. I want to say a very special thank you to Shanti Nagarkati and Sue and Melvin Gray for their generous support of the Writers on Writing programming series. And I'm going to ask all of you to mark your calendars now for two upcoming Writers on Writing events. On Thursday, March 21st, we welcome poet, essayist, and music critic Hanif Abdurraqib in conversation with Eve L. Ewing. And on Tuesday, May 7th, poet Jericho Brown will be in conversation with Robin Schiff. I want to thank Story Studio Chicago for partnering, us, partnering with us on these programs. Story Studio Chicago is a nonprofit creative writing education center offering classes and other programming to help writers of any age or level of expertise hone their craft. It has been an absolute thrill to work with and get to know the staff of Story Studio and bring these two great organizations together. If you found us through Story Studio and this is your first time attending the Newberry, a Newberry event, I do want to just take a quick moment to help you understand how you can continue to engage with us after tonight's talk. Our collection, which spans 600 years of human history, is your collection. You may, for example, wish to dig into our modern manuscripts collections, which you can explore in our reading rooms free of charge to view handwritten letters, poems, and prose from writers including Sherwood Anderson, Carl Sandburg, Gwendolyn Brooks, Willa Cather, and Eve Ewing. And if you are unable to make it to Chicago, we have a wide array of digital collections and tools available via our website. We offer adult education classes and free exhibitions and programs just like this one to help us deepen our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. I do hope tonight is just the beginning of you exploring your curiosity at the Newberry. And perhaps that begins with an exhibition. Our exhibition galleries will be open this evening until 7.30. We invite you to view our current exhibition, Seeing Race Before Race, which investigates the roots of race from the Middle Ages to the 1800s. Programs like this one are free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. If you would like to support our work, I encourage you to do so by making a gift at newberry.org slash give. Following tonight's discussion, both of our speakers will be in the lobby signing copies of their books. If you need a copy, do not worry, the Newberry Bookshop has you covered. At the conclusion of tonight's event, we will convene a question and answer session. We do ask that you text your questions to the number you see on the screen, 833-899-3399. This is both for those of you in the room and those of you who are viewing us from home. This number will continue to be displayed throughout the talk. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, the reason you're all here. Lauren Groff is a three-time National Book Award finalist and New York Times best-selling author of the novels The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, Fates and Furies, and Matrix, and the celebrated short story collections Delicate Edible Birds and Florida. Her latest novel, The Vaster Wilds, was released just last month. Rebecca Mackay is the Chicago-based author of the novels The Great Believers, a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, The Hundred Year House, and The Borrower. Her latest novel, I Have Some Questions for You, was released in February and was an instant New York Times bestseller. She is on the MFA faculties of Sierra Nevada College and Northwestern University and is artistic director of tonight's programming partner, Story Studio Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Lauren and Rebecca.
Thank you so much. And before I before we get into it, um, most of these events, I'll actually be over there at the podium doing another introduction after Vince. So I'm going to kind of do that really quickly from up here. Um, it has been so delightful to work with the Newberry. Um, Story Studio is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Um, and I'll kind of do the inverse and say that if you're discovering Story Studio through the Newberry or because you're a giant Lauren Groff fan, um, we hope that you will... Uh, Come in and see some of what we have to offer. If there's a writer in your life, any age from middle school to uh, as old as you can get, uh, we have programming, whether it's single session classes, year-long classes. We have classes online. Um, we threw up a series uh, very early in the pandemic called the Pajama Seminars and started bringing in authors from just about everywhere to teach master classes. And it was such a success that we're still doing it. You can look for those if you're not local. Um, if you're writing a novel, I'm teaching a six-week online open enrollment novel class uh, starting in November. Um, we have a festival coming up in person the first weekend of November as well with keynote speaker Ruman Alam, and uh, that would be for, great for both readers and writers. We're uh, mostly focused on writers, but there's, there's something for everyone there, so please check us out. We have a lot of brochures and things like that. Um, I am the one who's been curating this series, and as long as it continues to go as well as this, we hope this will be an ongoing thing. Really quickly, if you don't know who Hanif Abdurraqib or Jericho Brown are, hopefully you saw the buzz of excitement around you from people who do. Um, I want to come back for these events. Yeah, yeah, seriously. These are some amazing and important writers, um, and... Uh, you know, there will be people that we bring here whose work you already know, but part of the thing of a series like this is bringing in writers whose work you maybe don't know. Um, hopefully, maybe all of you already know both those writers, um, but if you don't, you have a lot of time to check out their work first and then come join us uh, for those events uh, later, it, actually in 2024. So, thank you. So, yay! Okay, we just start talking. Um, so uh, if I were doing a more personal introduction here, and Vince did a, a great job, so I'm not going to like introduce you, um, but I will say that um, I've been following your work forever, and you're one of the few authors that I'm a completist for, which is, you know, the more books you write becomes more of a thing, because it's one thing to be like a Harper Lee completist, right? And it's another thing. <laughs> so, um, but um, the very first thing that I read from you was a short story um, in Best American Short Stories called Eldebard and Aliette, which was about the 1918 flu, pan flu pandemic. Um, and it's something that I pulled out again at the beginning of COVID because I was like, I need to read something about something relating to this. Um, and then I've been following your work very um, enthusiastically ever since. So it's really fun always to talk to you. Um, and what we're trying to do with these conversations is I'm not really interviewing Lauren about her new book, although she is in this case on book tour. Um, story Studio, and sorry, it's sold out, but is doing something about her book in the morning. Next time, you, you know, if you're interested, you can get on that early. We have a brunch the morning after to talk about the book. It'll come up, because I just finished it, and I've been holding off, enthusing all over you. Um, but we're going to talk about your whole entire career, and um, lots of stuff about craft, the stuff that maybe doesn't get talked about in a bookstore where we're just there to sell a book. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that sounds good. Great, but also, before I say this, I love Chicago. Yeah. It's like, it's this really, right? I, like, I'm not actually pandering. Like, I, <laughs> I was walking around today, and I've been everywhere in the past month, and this is clean New York. Right? <laughs> <laughs> really yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. And I also have to say, I love this woman so much. If you haven't read, so my first story of hers was The Suitcase, which is, like, a mind-blowingly great fable, right? Mm. Would you call it a fable? Yeah, I would yeah. say that, yeah. Phenomenal, right? And that was in Best it's also American, American Short Story. Best American Short Story. It was in the 2006. I think 2008, something like Eight. that. Okay. Somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, and I was just like, who is this woman? <laughs> I love her. So uh, I'm also a completist of yours. Uh, so thank you, thank it's, a, it's a love fest. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Um, okay, so one, the, the, the first thing I really want to ask you, and this is almost the framework for everything, is that I think that one thing we have in common as writers is that for both of us, every one of our books is completely different than the other books. Mm. And I don't know, you know, I'm assuming you probably had a similar experience where every time I have a new book come out, people go, oh my God, this is so different from your last one. Why did you suddenly? Um, 
And I understand because I think there are writers who find sort of a niche, mm -hmm. a vibe, maybe even a story that goes on and on. Mm -hmm. um, and there are writers who, for me, I just, I, would, I need to rebel mm -hmm. dramatically against the last thing I worked on. Mm -hmm. Not disavow it, just go the other direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering, first of all, do you relate to that? I mean, there are a lot of themes that I could, like, there are threads I can find through your books. But do you get that reaction from people? Oh, and yeah. do you feel like that's true? Oh, massively. And I, like you, I try to actually detonate the other book with the, with the yeah, book, yeah, right? right? Yeah. You're trying to actually blow it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why, but I actually do know why. I, it's because I don't want to write the same story. I actually, when I start to write... A book. I want to to not know how to do it. Yeah, it, it, the, the, a lot of the joy is in trying to figure out how to sail the boat as you're building the boat. Right, you're already yeah. out on the water and it's terrifying. And yeah. how are you building this boat and sailing at the same time? Right, and, and that's like the 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 juggling um, that you're doing at the at the time. So, yeah. what about you? Why do you do this? Yeah, I mean, it's that. I think I, you know, I I have ADHD, and I think that works on the large scale as well as the small scale yeah. of like I don't want to live in that same world again. I want something completely different now. Um, yeah, and, and to, for something to be shiny and new and appealing enough that you want to spend five years of your life or however long living there, it has to have things going on that weren't true of the other books, I think. Yeah. yeah. Also, you know, I don't know if you get this too, but I often get people who are a little disappointed by the new book. Oh, yeah. It's not like the previous one too. Yeah. But you're, you know, and for these people, I totally understand, but I just want to say we're, we're in it as friends for the long term, and yeah. you're not going to love everything that I write, yeah. and some, yeah. sometimes you're actually really not going to like something that I write, yeah. and that's fine. Right, and we're taking, you take that risk dramatically mm -hmm. when you write something so completely different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Florida was in the middle there, but a lot of people discovered you through Fates and Furies, which mm -hmm. was really your breakout in a, in a huge way. And then the next novel you give them is Matrix, <laughs> which is about medieval nuns. Yeah, yes, <laughs> and yeah. Like, and there uh, are no men at all in the book. Yeah, yeah. Not, no, even not the at animals all. are female or yeah. like non-gendered. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Versus this book that was very much about marriage and very mm -hmm. contemporary, and like the male perspective was there, and just as like as different as you could be. This is where like I don't think you know, like an AI is never going to like write. I mean, well, you know, right? Because well, what would it do? It would, it would rehash, and that's not what you do. That's not what that's not right. what writers really do at right. all, right? Right. Um, so, okay, within that though, there's this interesting shift that the last two books have been historical mm -hmm. um, in a pretty profound way, and you could say like Arcadia was historical in a sense that went back to the I guess the '80s, '70s, yeah, sixties, yeah. '70s, '60s, '80s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't lived through anything but the end of that yeah yeah um so but this I mean both of these are so historical mm -hmm. that they're requiring you to adopt a different diction mm -hmm. and certainly there's got to be a ton of historical research as well but just like a different voice a different mode of writing um so do you feel I mean are those two books to you part of the same project in terms of going in a certain direction? Is there going to be a third along those lines? You don't have to say, you don't actually have to answer that unless you want to. Um, but like, is that, um, do, are they are they kind of going hand in hand in a certain direction? Absolutely. Good job. Okay. You found it. Um, so, so, the th so I actually started The Bastard Wild before Matrix. Uh, and um, I, you know, a couple of years in, I had a fellowship at Radcliffe. It was amazing. I started listening to incredible people who are physicists, like um, geologists, historians, sculptors, give these talks. And I was taken over by Matrix because my friend, Dr. Katie Bookish, gave this great talk about medieval nuns. And I remember Marie de France. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. But I realized as I started writing this, that book that what I really wanted to do is write a triptych. So it's not... Um, it's I not a trilogy, so. right? No, 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 no trilogy, yeah. right? That's right. definitely the wrong because word. Because they're but. so profoundly different in yeah. terms of structure and language and um, um, ideas and things like that. But I wanted to, I wanted to s sort of send three books across time, like yeah. um, skipping a stone in some ways, to try to figure out how we got to where we are now yeah. in the Anthropocene, right? How religion bore down on that, how um, the role of women and our our interaction with nature, all of these things. Things are sort of swirling around all of all of these three books. Yeah. So actually, in 2019, I threw 
um, all three books into the laps of my uh, editor and agent and ran away crying. Wow. Um, and like the third one, okay, let's be honest, like it, it, I've also written since then like eight separate drafts of this, but, and it won't be done maybe ever and then it'll be a diptych. It's totally <laughs> fine. It's good. Um, completely fine. But my conception of it is as sort of singing in different registers about yeah. how we got to where we are. That's amazing. And this is, I mean, and well, we we should talk um, enough about the new book because I mean, assuming some of you have read it and others haven't, and you all going to, um, but um, do you? Uh, before I ask you this question, do you want to do your like? 30 second thing about what the book is about because I'm oh, sure, sure you have one. <laughs> oh yeah I don't even I actually don't have one. Um, no? Yeah so it's it's for, for in the 1609 and 1610 in Jamestown Virginia which is the first permanent English settlement in the U.S. there was a starving time a winter where over 80 percent of the people died of famine violence um, fluxes like eggs, plagues, um, mm -hmm. malaria, everything yeah. that you can possibly imagine. And it was a really, really terrible time. So my protagonist leaves, who's a, a servant girl, she's unregarded, she's not of the elect. Um, something her terrible happens and she leaves the, the fortress. She has no conception of um, the scale and scope of the new world and she's trying to get away. Yeah. That's basically it, That's right? It, yeah. As yeah. my 12-year-old my read it, actually, um, which <laughs> like, really touched me. Um, and he said, his, his perceive was, the girl is always hungry, but she's also always eating. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, that is his idea of the book. And he's not wrong. Yeah. And, it's really, yeah. and there's yeah. some disgusting eating scenes in a great way. Yeah, really film. disgusting oh yes. animal scenes. Yes. Yeah. Fairlix was Family Robinson in the, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, so one of the things, you know, as I'm looking at those two, two books so far together, um, with the Matrix, no, not the. Thank you. Nope. I love you. <laughs> I caught so myself. <laughs> Matrix. The Matrix. Although, is Keanu Reeves. Yeah, I mean Keanu as a yeah. nun <laughs> could be really awesome. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. actually, that would be amazing. Yeah. I would have suggest yeah. that. Yeah, that mash up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in Matrix, um, you have you know this very female ruled world, right, mm -hmm. of this convent, even though they don't have real agency as much as we want within the world. Mm -hmm. But then there's also, like, the way nature comes into that book is they're building this, this like, literal maze mm -hmm. around, you know, building themselves farther and farther in so that it's, like, patterned nature and in their control. Mm -hmm. And you have just about the exact opposite here. Instead of a society of women, you have one woman mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. with absolutely no power and just absolutely surrounded by total wilderness. Yeah. Which, I mean, we're, and you know, as you, like for me, themes like that emerge subconsciously and I recognize them after I've written, mm -hmm. but I know not everyone works that way. Are you kind of conceptualizing these thematically in that sense or are you kind of writing it and going, oh, I did the exact opposite? No, so I, especially, I try to make myself incredibly stupid in the first, like, <laughs> it helps. probably four years of the book, right? Yeah. Because you really, if you intellectualize, too much, you killed the book, I yes. think. I killed the book. You no, may not. But. No, I do not. I, I mean, I like I do right. the same thing and I'm always cautioning students because the people like students will come in and they're like, it's gonna prove this and it's gonna show this and where it is gonna symbolize freedom. And it's like, ah yeah. take your hands off the wheel a little right, bit here. Right. Yeah. No, I mean I think those things, I mean, I think as long as you're writing into your urgencies, right? Yeah. Into the things that are really, that, that light you up in the morning, that make you want to scream or want to burn or sit the world down or, um, or, or change the world, you're always going to end up talking about the same things, yes. I think, right? Yeah. right? Because we're given a discrete number of topics that, that really speak to our soul. And yeah. uh, so I think that uh, no matter what, those themes are going to come out. And it's not our job in the beginning to right. coax them out. It's our job maybe in editing yes. or um, in the final draft, like the good draft. Yeah. yeah. Or even for me, sometimes it's like, it's the, the final draft is done, but it's like, can you approve this copy for the back of the book? And I right. read it and like, oh, that's what I wrote about. Oh, oh yeah. So <laughs> the best thing about book tour is that you meet a lot of really smart people who tell you yes. things about your yes. books that you're like, you're 100% correct. <laughs> you had no idea. Yes. Right? I mean, it's really oh, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, right. And it's it might be that they, in some cases, it's almost like they psychoanalyze you. You're like, oh, I did put. And like, you just have to pretend that it was intentional. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it was subconsciously intentional. Def- I mean, yeah. sometimes someone will come up with something. What I love is when they do it in a review. They're like, she clearly meant right. to reference this. They're like, I've never even heard of that. I thing. don't even read my reviews. So <laughs> no, I yeah. hope, yeah, 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 yeah. You were much stronger uh, than I am. I'm a very weak person. I can't read them. That's, but no, that is strength. No. You understand? Weakness is looking at Goodreads. Weakness oh, yeah, that's, is yeah, like, that's right. <laughs> do not do that. <laughs> About anything. Yeah, like, no. I looked at Middlemarch one day, and I was devastated oh, yeah. for like three weeks. Yeah. Right? It was really On her behalf. so sad. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not good out there. Um, but no, but people say, you know, it might be that this little thing and you're like, oh my God, like I didn't mean that, but, but yes, right. sometimes it's, it's, I didn't mean that and no. Oh, um, for sure. Right. But at that point, um, but it's the, out of your hands. Right. Well, you, you've done 50% of the work, but only 50% of yeah. the work and the reader does the other 50%. Yeah. Right. And they're yeah. bringing all of their own stuff to the book as well, which is, kind, this, which is well, why it's a superior form to the visual form in terms of um, to a narrative. Form, yeah. Right. As soon as something is set into a TV show or a film, it becomes a monoculture. But yes. at, when it's a book, it's, yes. it's as vast as the number of readers you have. Yeah. Right? Which is so glorious. It's amazing. Yeah, like, I think my only issue is when someone like it, like very confidently says that I meant to do something. And it's yeah. like, no, you can't say that. You can say that it had that effect. You can say what it is, mm-hmm. but like don't. Like... I don't fight. It. Oh, no, I don't yeah, actually no, okay. either. No, I'm good. just saying it I now. Would love to see you fight <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, no, I would never actually like do, like no, someone can say anything to me and I'll be like, "Wow, yeah, thank you for right. reading." Um, That's not right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to talk about process because, and I I think this is something because I know that you have an unusual drafting process. I know that you have to answer this question all the time, Um, but I do think it's fascinating. And I think it's, um, and the example that I always, I'll use you as actually as an example when I'm talking to students about the range of possibilities in drafting. Mm-hmm. And on one end of the spectrum, I'll put Kevin Brockmeyer. <gasps> That's, I use him too. When okay, I there we students. go. Yeah, oh my God. Oh my God. He's, if you don't know Kevin Brockmeyer, incredible, quirky, brilliant, brilliant yeah. writer from Arkansas, writing like nobody else. Yeah. His, but how, the way he writes is he writes one sentence and then he revises it and then he revises it when again. It's perfect. Yes. And then he writes the second sentence, it revises right. it, revises, then he goes back and does the first and second, right. second together. And then he does, and he hates his process. Right. Do you know what he said to me once? What? He said, well, you would never clean a kitchen by just like mopping the whole floor at once. You'd clean tile by tile. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. I know. I oh, thought God. it was amazing. Oh, Kevin. I guess that's how he's like, all his kids just like cleaning each other. I'm picturing like a little Wes Anderson house with yeah. Kevin cleaning. That's yeah. amazing. Wow. Um, so when I am yeah. explaining, when I'm talking to students, I kind of put him at one end of the spectrum. And then I'm like, but then there's Lauren Groff on this end. And I feel like I'm going to mangle it. And I don't know. I mean, I know I'm sure this is the thing you're sick of talking about. But... Not, it's fine. I just feel defensive because people have attacked me over it. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no, it's okay. Oh, I think it's it sounds fine. magical. Oh, I think... I think it's magical too. Yeah. Um, Do you want to, no. Okay. Do you explain? Do you, okay. All okay. right. So I think, you know, when people get mad at me, it's about them, not me. It's fine. Yes. Um, but, okay. So I have OCD. And I think part of uh, learning how to be an artist is working with what you have and what your limitations are. So um, if I were to work on a computer, it's too close to the printed text, I would be stuck in a single paragraph for four years, right? I could never move on. I could never actually see the whole scope of the story. So I've intentionally found a way to break my own process over and over again um, in order to break my perfectionism and to to get out of this the rut. Um, So what I do is, I write everything longhand up until the very, very end, uh, and I cannot read my own handwriting. Um, and this is a really good thing um, because I don't want to read my own hand- handwriting, right? I want to just go straight for it. So um, for Vaster, I gave myself a discrete amount of time to do the historical research, and then I wrote within a month a first draft of the book straight through without rereading a single word that I write. So you're sort of building everything. It's just a disaster. It's meant to be a disaster. It's meant to have no punctuation. Um, It's meant to have no um, through lines or clarity, right? I'm just really like sketching. Um, And then I put it into a box. Um, And in that beautiful gap 
uh, there's, it's wonderful because it just, it's cathartic. Like everything that shouldn't be in the book is swept away. Yeah. The strong things that remain. And then I start over again, long hands, same thing, um, with a far clearer understanding of what I'm doing. And then I'll put it to the side, do more research because I always find the gaps in my research. And then, you know, I do this over and over again for Vaster. It was nine drafts and on the ninth draft, I'm trying to interpret my own handwriting, which is impossible because it's mm. so bad. Um, and what that does is that actually breaks my perfectionism too, because on the page I'll have something, but in my mind, my mind is wi wilder than, than what's on the page. And so it'll suggest something unusual and strange. So mm. I break the text there too. And I got that from Anne Sexton. There's this amazing, um, she has this amazing poem where she writes this line uh, that began as running toward God, uh, but she couldn't read her own handwriting because she was on high doses of lithium at the time. Ooh, wow. And um, it, do it. it became rowing toward God, which is so much more evocative, yeah. right? It's so much better. It's such a, it's a better verb. Yeah. Um, so so in, I try through my process to break yeah. and break and break. And then by breaking, I'm building, if that makes any yeah, sense. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. when you, I mean... I'm assuming these drafts are getting longer. Yeah, they're getting longer. They're getting yeah. more sophisticated. I'm starting to understand the architecture. I'm starting to understand the way that the characters move. And the other thing, too, that this does, which is kind of beautiful, is you're throwing these scenes out into the world. And as um, there's an accretion of understanding about what's happening both on the page eventually, but also off the page, right? The, the, the scenes that didn't make it in sort of give some of the things that are on the page some weight. It's sort of like the... Uh, the part of the iceberg that's under the water, that's sort of giving yeah. the, the part on top a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I think that, like, I think about that and I just, my arm starts to hurt. I know. But, <laughs> but I love the idea. I have really strong forearms. I'll yeah. show you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right? Oh, my God. Like, so like a squash player. Like yeah. a, um, I think what's interesting is my equivalent of that, I actually weirdly have a very similar process. It's just all mental. Yeah. So I right. will think about a book for like two years yeah. before I write it. And that includes like scenes and lines. And it's just, um, I always I, I joke about, I always feel like there's a scene in um, the movie Amadeus when the guy comes to, the bad guy comes to check if he's written the Requiem. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I have. And he's like, well, where is it? It's, and Mozart is totally drunk. And he's like, it's all up here in my noodle. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he sounds um, like, you know, he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's losing it. Um, right. But I'm like, oh, that's, that's what I sound like when I say that. Yeah. I've been working on a book for two years and I don't have anything yeah. written. No, it makes sense, but though. it's yeah. a similar... Yeah, you're building it, right? And, and you're always building it in the subconscious anyway, right? The book yeah. doesn't happen on the page. It happens as you're working through it. Right. And I think yeah. it's, it's that big picture thing of like, you know, if you had committed words to a page and seriously edited them the amount of time you've put into something, right? Like I can, right. when it's all up here or when it's like in the box, you can be like, yeah, you know what? She's she's not a doctor, she's a dancer. And it's just done. But the other thing too is you figure out the foundational issues before you even start to worry about yes. the, the language. And yes. the language is for me the most important part, right? I came from poetry mm -hmm. and I don't want to actually spend, I'd waste the language, right? So because it takes a huge amount of work to, to, to get things right. But if you're trying to do language and architecture and characters and yeah. all of this all at the same time, yeah. it just seems like too overwhelming for me personally. That's how other people do it. That's totally fine. I love them. Yeah. Do your thing. Um, but I couldn't do it. Yeah. 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 If we need a craft book called How Do You Mop Your Floor? And we just like interview <laughs> writers about number one, how do they mop a floor? And number two, how do they write? And see what the like. <laughs> but if you do have that, they'll, instead of writing, they'll go mop their floors. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> right? It's all I do. Right? Yeah. So this actually, you, that was the perfect segue. So you mentioned poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of want to do this like time machine thing with you a little bit okay. and go through. So exciting. Yeah. But so I think the, the transition there for me, partly it's, it, well, I will say something about the, the poetry of your language um, by way of getting back to talking about those roots and then maybe going chronologically, which was that I think, um, I, as I said, I first, you know, found that one short story. I loved it. I read your first novel. I loved it. And then there was this moment in Arcadia um, where, and I, I'm 
believe me, I am mangling this. This is not the language, but the image was that there are blackbirds um, up on the roof, and it looks like someone has like they're it's buttoning the the barn to the sky. I love that. I didn't even know that you I wrote totally that. wrote that. So <laughs> <laughs> um, that was Lauren like fifteen years ago. Totally much younger. Good job. It was yeah. this amazing sentence, and it was for me. It, it's like it's not just about language, because as you heard, I just mangled the language, um, and it was still really beautiful. It was this, it was image. Um, and I think what people don't necessarily, you know, people think about poetry, they think first about language, and they don't necessarily think about image, but mm. that's really part of it. And the startling image, the image that on the, at, at simultaneously, you have never seen this before, mm -hmm. you've never seen it that way before, but it is deeply recognizable. Mm. Um, and that, that was just this moment of like, to me, that line is who you are as a writer. And I love that you don't remember that you wrote it. Because that's like, <laughs> if someone asked me about your work, I'd be like, well, let me tell you about these birds on the roof. Um, so uh, so can, we, let's, can we go back to like your beginnings as a writer mm. and kind of go like chronologically, this is your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, so would, I mean, the earliest things that you wrote. Um, of your own volition. Was that poetry? Was it fiction? And when was that? Yeah, so I actually was not really exposed at all to contemporary fiction. I, I read a huge amount of um, fiction from like the bargain bins at the library, yeah. which uh, was amazing. I like it's really good stuff. It's, you know, Jane Austen because you, they go through a lot of Jane Austen. <laughs> um, and O. Henry. I read a lot of O. Henry, but really I didn't understand that living people could write fiction. Um, but someone gave me, and maybe we don't, uh, <laughs> but someone gave me, my friends at the time gave me um, a collected edition of uh, Emily Dickinson's poetry, mm. which for some reason, maybe because it, it's so accessible in a certain way, even though it's so elliptical at the same time. It's intimate. It's, it's intimate and it's, it's brilliant. Even a 12-year-old can understand how mind-blowingly full of genius it is, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So it gave me permission to try. And, to, and so I was a secret poet all the way um, to college, and then I tried to become a public poet, but it didn't work. Um, um, I'm not a good poet, um, but I took a fiction class, and it was like the clouds parted, the <laughs> angels put their faces down and yelled at me, um, because that's what I wanted to do, right? Yeah. And, and that's when I was exposed to, um, I think it was Grace Paley was oh, the wow. one, was the first story that we read, and if you haven't read Grace Paley, oh, it's yeah. like the very best, right? And it was, I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it right now, I actually have a a visual image of the story. It's once, um, which is probably mm -hmm. my favorite of her stories, actually. Yeah. Um, so th the fact that these people who speak like people I know were writing these stories um, that I, I felt like I could do, um, that was my first introduction to what I do now. Yeah. yeah. And then, so were you, you were writing short stories. Mm -hmm. You have an MFA. Right. Yeah, I spent three years as a bartender ah. um, and an admin assistant at Stanford, um, and I wrote three novels in that time. No way. Yeah, yeah, and they were not good, <laughs> um, which is great for, I mean, we all it's, need it's to get really those out. Right? Yeah. yeah, and then I went to grad school, and I worked on uh, my first two books there. Yeah. So your first novel and your first story collection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about you? Um, I don't have an MFA. But, oh, um, right, yeah. but um, yeah, very, I mean, um, yeah, that's interesting. I think, I think also poetry when I was young, but also plays. I was a little, I was nice. a playwright. I made, oh, all, wow. I made all my friends be in plays. Nice. Puppet shows, plays at school, plays in my driveway. Um, oh. And then, are you going to write a play? Rebecca I, I seriously want to. I like. I oh studied God. that all the way through college, and then I'll, I'll didn't really it. do it. Thank you. I'll have one person in the audience. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I mean, it is, it's weird because there's a really funny thing happens actually in the literary world where at a certain point, and it starts around college and then definitely by grad school, the playwrights go off with the actors and the yeah, directors and the poets and fiction writers and nonfiction writers all go off together. Right. And it's... Well, the poets it's, go off alone. The poets kind of, like yeah. like wandering yeah, in the daffodils. But, but they're at the same, yeah, they're at the same conferences. Yeah, they're at the same period. festivals, right? Yeah. So, um, like you go to Breadloaf and it's poets, right? Oh, I see right? what you mean. Right? Yeah. Um, Whereas, like, you just never see the playwrights again. 
Like, no, oh, it's true. you guys are yeah. off. Yeah. That's yeah, very true. Um, and they become screenwriters. They, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. not every time. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, it's one reason that TV is so good right now yeah. is there are a lot of playwrights in Hollywood. Um, but, yeah, it's like, are they just, that ship just kind of sailed, and then you're like, oh, I got yeah. to quit. Okay. I'll, I'll hop back on it at some point. Um, but so, so um, I have then, okay, so, so sorry, I, w- I want to ask one more chronological question, and then I have like a craft question that, that feeds into all of it. Um, you, you know, I think that I see not only, um, obviously, every book is different from every other one in, in terms of what you've written, but also there seems like there is like, in a, in a wonderful way that you'd expect from a writer, an evolution, a deepening, like a, a getting at kind of harder issues, taking bigger risks. Um, so um, do you, you know, you look back at those early books, what do you see that was in those that's still very much how you write? <laughs> the hardest question. It is, because there's so much for me, there's so much I would disavow, or be like, yeah, eh, I was so same. young, yeah. but then like, what is there that well, like... Also, I don't know, okay, I don't know if that's our role, right? I think that's it the doesn't have to be. role. Yeah. Um, right, I, I mean, I don't know if we need to contextualize our, our entire work. Maybe it's no. the work at hand that matters. Yeah. It's not that I'm refusing to answer no, your question. No, you, you can refuse. Um, uh, you can refuse. Okay. I don't know what is similar. I think yeah. maybe, you know, this is what someone has said to me, and so I'm going to take it. So I'm, I'm obsessed with community, and I am. Yeah, yeah. And even in The Best of Wilds, there's one person out, and it's like a, the negation of community yes. that is, is actually happening. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so there's that. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's some kind of experimentation. Yeah. Right. In everything. Right. Yeah. I'm always experimenting with something. It's and interesting because I feel like yeah. like Monsters of Templeton. Like I mean, there's a sea monster that yeah. washes up right in this lake. Lake monster. Lake monster. Yeah. Lake monster yeah. Right. Lake yeah. monster. Um, and th- that's something that like on the one hand, I look at that and be like, yeah, she didn't. You could see that author maybe going off in this speculative direction mm-hmm. from that point. And once in a while, in your short stuff, you do. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I, what you wouldn't predict is that you look at that and it's like water is always really, oh, really yeah. um, ominous when it shows up in your work. And I have to tell you, right? It's not the writer who's actually smart yeah. about these things. Yeah. yeah I get, I, do you want me to turn that question to you, toward you? I, which question? The one that is you water just ominous? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's panicking because it's a really hard no, question no, no, and no. it's not our job. No. But no, go but ahead. I, you answer I it. Do see, go no, it. I do see. I yeah. see like... Um, okay. I am I am realized early on that I was going to be most comfortable writing about artists and academics, which is still usually what I do yeah. um, in some way or other. And that started, you know, started with my first book. It's about a librarian, but like, yeah. you know, still. Um, and I also think that if I, like, if I look back at my early work, just the voice, I think the balance of like darkness and humor, not dark humor, but darkness yeah, yeah. and humor. Right, the um, tunnel. Yeah, I think yeah. that that's there for me. And okay. I can see myself. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's it is it is really hard. It's also just really hard to look back at earlier work. Oh like, boy, yeah. It's like looking at pictures or videos of yourself at very awkward times. Right? Yes, yeah. right, right. And you're yeah. like, oh, look how beautiful and young I was. But yeah. also, oh my god. Yeah. Right? What, what was, was I, I wearing? wearing? Yeah. yeah to, yes. Horrible. It's a lot like that. Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh god. Like, yeah. Like, oh, such a nice baby face. But then, what are oh. the shoulder pads? I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 But now all the fashion when we were teenagers is back. Oh, totally. Totally. We're super hip. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. It's great because your kids look at your yearbook and you actually look cool. And you're like, I wasn't even cool. I just look like. Yeah. yeah that's great. <laughs> um, so okay. Um, one of the things that I think um, was striking me as I read the Buster Wilds, and that has struck me with previous books of yours, um, and I think is. It's not necessarily that it's a sign of maturity, but it, ha- you, it really has to be, I think, a sign of tremendous confidence from a writer, is your ability to use omniscient points of view when you want to without getting stuck up there or stuck down here. And you can kind of just go over, like we're suddenly in, like there's a man passing by and we're in his point of view. Mm-hmm. Or there are these children playing on the riverbank and we're in their point of view. Mm-hmm but we're still centered mostly in this young girl's point of view. Or I think about In Fates and Furies, you have this amazing moment where 
um, I think we're really primarily in one point of view and then another, but we're in Lotto's point of view. It's the first half of the book and there's like singing Christmas carols and you just have this passage where someone looks in, mm -hmm. is passing by and sees these people singing and like for the rest of their life has this idea that that's what a happy family looks like. And it's this incredible moment of just kind of dipping in with this other point of view and leaving. Um, it's hard to do, it's really hard to do. Um, it's hard to do well, and it's hard to do at all. So this is what, like, you know, do you, I'm not gonna ask you to analyze like your evolution on that or anything like that, but do you think consciously about point of view when you write? Do you let it happen? Do you make those decisions like strategically? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm i attracted to the omniscience. Yeah. Uh, you know, always. Uh, and it, I think it, I actually think it's because I was raised in a godly family. So interesting. Right? Uh, so I was just the editor for the O. Henry Prize stories, which is a great, oh, the people yeah. in that, it's amazing this year, right? They're really good, really good yes. stories. Oh, you haven't read it yet. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Um, no, it's really, really good. But I have to say, like, 90% of the stories that I was given, and I, got, I read, like, a thousand stories, yeah. were in the first person. Yeah. And I think it's because people are afraid of God now yeah. or sort of like yeah. like or or there's this like secular distrust mm -hmm. um which I completely understand yeah. where the self even though it is unstable is still a more um a stable point of view yeah. for a lot of people especially a lot of younger people which is really fascinating yeah but for me um omniscience is a way of disrupting the linear timeline. Um, so, so you have the linear timeline, which you know I've seen represented my entire life as a, almost like a landscape, right? It, yeah. It's something that's sort of unrolling in front of you. Um, and someone like Proust can go back and forth across the landscape or sort of jump over like a lake in the landscape, yeah. right? Like he's really good at playing with time, but what, if you're really close to a character, there's a, the, their perception of time, but then there's this additional verticality of the, the omniscient voice coming down and sort of putting spikes into that sort of very close thing. Yeah. So what I really want to do is I want to just like earthquake that, that person once in a while, right? I want to so come cool. down and just yeah. push them a little bit. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's, I've heard, like, Rick Moody, apparently someone asked him on stage, like, why do we see less omniscience? And he goes, because God is dead. Like, <laughs> oh, because God is dead. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Like, yeah. in a Nietzsche, oh, you know, Nietzsche yeah. sense. Oh. But, um, like, meaning, like, people are just not. But I think what's interesting is what I see, especially when I look at, like, um, just, like, novel, it's, it's, you know, novels both being published and just being drafted now. Mm -hmm is I think what's replaced that so much is a pluralistic voice, a polyphonic. So like it's mm. like, I'm gonna have 32 points of view in this novel. Right. It's almost like, because like as a society, we might have less interest in, you know, deities and more interest in everybody has a voice, everybody gets a seat at the table. Huh. Um, but it's almost become like, and I love a good like multi point of view novel. But then I see students where they just can't help adding voices. And right. They just uh, the solution right. to everything is to add another voice right, right. until you have like, you know seventy two voices. Um, but I think it's almost I think in some ways it's like they are missing that ability to to leave one character's head, mm -hmm. um, and so they're searching for it in that way instead okay, that of feeling. Sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't know. Like I, I you know I I love the polythonic. Um, I do too. Yeah, I do. when it's done as really long well. as it makes sense, right? As right. long as it, it needs to be there, it needs, it needs to be urgent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when it's not, it's otherwise it just it gets to be a writing exercise. Right. Yeah, but I love the way you phrased that about it kind of coming down and like pinning the character and it, it, like that that perspective and the. I mean, I think even in the Vester Wilds, um, these moments when we see this girl from the outside by people she passes by or people who see her. Um, or it's simply, it's not necessarily their point of view. It's like the narrator, the narrative voice coming in and saying, she was actually going the wrong direction. Right, well, <laughs> um, no, that's so necessary for this book because that's the irony, right? Yes, that's exactly. That's like the really, really bitter irony yes. in this book. It's yes, sad. yeah, yeah. right, yeah. it is. Um, but yeah, it's like that. that's how we get, that is the vastness actually, right? Mm -hmm. The vastness is in of course the woods, but it's in the point of view. That's the, those are the moments when we can see how tiny she is in this landscape. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. So beautifully. Yeah.
Thank you, my friend. Yeah. That's very okay, good. this is a good time, I think, for me to get this iPad and start reading. I'm going to choose. That's masterfully on time. Well, really yeah, well done, it is literally 6.45, so right? so good at this. All right. It should be like a circus Yeah. MC. And actually, this is cool because this first question, I guess maybe it came out of that last answer. I'm going to scroll through here while you're answering this, but is there anything in the writing process that feels similar to a religious experience for you? <gasps> yes, and I know you can uh, answer this too. So I love this part. Every time I write a novel, not a short story per se, but a novel, there's a there's there are times like many years where there's almost like a shrinking down, right? Like um, the world is sort of shrinking into the book, and then at a certain point, it sort of blooms outward, mm -hmm. and everything that you do and everything that you see, everything that you read is somehow oh. feeding into the book. Yes, right. Yeah, and that is like almost a mystical, ecstatic experience. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. It's I know that I'm there on a book when. If I do, if I go to a yoga class, mm -hmm. and then at the end you're in savasana and you're like, I never, you know, you never literally clear your mind, but you're like, okay, I'm like totally relaxed, blah 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 blah, <laughs> and everything else clears away, mm -hmm. and what's there is my book, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking like really, it's like really important thoughts that I might have about it or just mm -hmm. see, but it's like when everything else is gone, that apparently that is at the base of my consciousness right now. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this is like. This has taken over in a really, really good way. Yeah, my husband knows I'm there when I like stop being able to see people. Oh, oh totally. <laughs> like my eyes go glassy. Yeah. And I, like the, the children say something to me, I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're just like a little robot. Totally. Like, robot mom. Totally. Um, so this one, I want to ask because we, um, I'm not going to explain much of this, but we were talking uh, beforehand about. Um, I would love advice on this, although I've, I've done this before, but I'm just in a, in a different way right now. But can you talk about how you incorporate historical research into your writing process? Do you feel like you need to do most or all of the research before you can start writing? No. <laughs> all right, here's the deal about being a novelist is that you, can, you don't need to know anything. <laughs> right? You could just be a big mm -hmm. dummy. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we're dilettantes, right? So we just go after whatever we're so passionate about yeah. at that moment. So the beautiful thing for me, I, I give myself, because of my OCD, I give myself a particular amount of time because otherwise I will go into the archives and be there yes. for a hundred years, right? Yeah. And never actually get anything done. So I, and I'll, it's joyous, right? I'm reading into <laughs> loops, right? I'm reading uh, wherever the reading takes me because it's really suggestive, right? So someone mentions, you know, Roland Barthes, and I'll start to read, like, Camera Lucida, yeah. and that'll bring me to something else, right? It's, it's just this, like, big loop. And then at the end of the specific amount of time, um, I got this from the great, great American writer, uh, Catherine Davis, who is amazing, and she is um, not as well known as she should yeah, be. I don't think I know her. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna send you some of her books. Um, she's incredible, but she wrote this book called Versailles. And it's about Versailles. It's almost like a ghost story in which there are almost no people, just Versailles. Um, but the way that she wrote it is she did years and years of research. She even went to Versailles and like counted off the footsteps from one end to the other uh, of the Hall of Mirrors. Where like she was really, she knew a lot about wow, Versailles. Wow, wow. But then she put all of that paper away. Yeah. And she just wrote the book dependent, depending on the things that she remembered. Yeah. And that's what I do. I write the book de like deeply depending on the things that I remember, and then knowing that I can always fix it yeah. later, right? We, I don't actually have to know exactly um, what someone would have eaten in, like, 1182 yeah. for, like, Lent, like, yeah. whatever. Like, someone knows that, right? Yeah. That's why historians are smart, and <laughs> we don't have to be, right? Yeah. Because we can go to them and, and get that from them. Yeah. But and, and then the, the writing process is the discovery of what you don't know. Uh, and then you can go fill that in yeah. later. So. I have very similar, I think, like, in layers. Yeah. Like, I yeah. want some background, but then once I start writing, I'm just going to leave a lot of blanks and then come back. Um, and, and unless you get to something where it's like, I really can't proceed unless I know this information because it's central blanks. to the plot. I don't leave blanks. I write around it. Interesting. Because if I don't remember it, then it's not important. True. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So, but we're yeah. different people. Yeah. But as, um, yeah. I think for me, it's kind of the like, right, it's, yeah, it's the, it, well, I'll like, leave a blank, but what I'll also do is I'll, like, I'll put brackets around things where it's like, I know I'm bullshitting here, mm -hmm. so I'm probably going to have to check this or whatever, mm -hmm. but I think, like, they ate this, 
but then I'm marking it so that I'll like. You don't ask. hear that little bell of bullshit when you read it later? No, because then I've confirmed. Okay. So you see what I mean? Like, so it's like, I, you know, if I'm going to put down, like, okay, they're going to eat dinner, it's 1950. And I'm like, they had tomato aspic. That sounds like 1950s. Yeah, and sounds, I put it down, yeah. but I put brackets around it. And then another day, um, later, or like when I'm bored, and then I'm going to Google that and be like, yes, that is indeed what they ate. I can take the brackets off. Or no, tomato aspic was wildly out of fashion by mm. 1950. Find something else. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, and then it's, and it still has to feel right. But it's like, yeah, not that I, it's not, yeah, not that it feels like it's bullshitting. I'm just like, I'm not sure. Okay. But yeah, the stuff I haven't fact checked yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is actually, uh, this comes kind of right off of what you were saying. So for both of us, you've mentioned having neurodivergences, OCD and ADHD, and how they interact with your writing process and choices. Can you talk about how you learn to leverage those aspects of yourselves? I like that word leverage. So I think that's perfect. Uh -huh. To great and unique benefit and how or whether you see yourselves as neurodivergent writers. Um, I think because I'm from a long line of OCD people, I feel like it's just normal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But I know it is neurodivergent. It's just yeah. that when you're raised um, like that, same, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I do think it's something that I had to work against and through. Yeah. Um, but you know, everyone, I, I feel like everyone does this, right? Every single, there's no normal. Yeah. Thank God, right? Yeah. Thank God, we're all a little bit messed up. Um, but um, so the person that I realized, I first realized did this really beautifully uh, is, was actually Cormac McCarthy, whom I love very dearly, loved very dearly. Uh, I thought he was an incredible writer, but I realized after having read his entire of um, that he barely wrote a single believable living woman. There are a lot of like believable dead ones. Uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah, uh, right? yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but he ended up turning that into a profound strength, right? right? So he started, so he figured this out about himself and he realized that uh, maybe instead of, you know, putting women into his books, he's going to write about the blasted manscape of the American West and the way that it's violence and like, you know, yeah. right? that's what he did. And he became a genius because of his limitation. So way back in the day when I read that, I realized, oh, yeah. okay, we, I can use um, the way that I am different um, yeah. than I guess the normal, uh, and and sort of try to 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 break my propensities and then you know, rely on them at a certain point too. Because yeah. honestly, when you finally are, when I'm finally sort of doing the um, the thing on the computer, which I hate, I hate my computer so much. <laughs> we have like it's such a hate hate relationship. Yeah. Um, but like I am, like I'm dialing in on on my obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Like I'm dialing in on the way like these words are working together, and it like I can focus on that, and I've yeah. already done everything else. So yeah. like, so it's very helpful to be really, really in. To yeah. Be there. yeah, yeah. I see similar. Like, well, first of all, I was I was only recently, like maybe five years ago, diagnosed with ADHD because women, girls just don't get to tend to get diagnosed in school because I would space out instead of throwing spitballs. Um, but um, it, yeah, I mean, similarly, I mean, I think there were already, even before I identified what I was doing and thought about leveraging in that sense, um, there's just a way that it, you know, just informs how I think. Mm -hmm. People with ADHD tend to think in very branchy mm -hmm. ways. Um, like, like rhizomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you'd say one thing and it reminds me of 10 different stories I could tell you right now and each one of those. Um, and, so, you know, that's something that already, like my books are always about a million different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that I have a really solid sense of when a reader might get bored mm -hmm. because I am so easily bored. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, and... Um, and hyper focus, right? Oh I mean, yeah, that's I have a son that is the with flip ADHD, side. And yeah, the hyper focus is amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's like a superpower. Yeah, right. No, yeah. that's like when I am really working on whatever it is. Yeah. If I'm really into it and I want to be working on it, that's the thing you can't force. Like yeah. you don't get to choose. But yeah, I could spend five hours and then be like, "Why are my legs asleep? What's going on?" Right. Like, oh wow. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's so there, there's that, but there's you know the, there are all these downsides that I didn't realize I had been compensating for already all my right, life. Right. Um, and you know, it is a disability in, in many ways. Like you, you know, it makes a lot of things very hard, but, um, 
you know, I mean, the, that's the more predictable conversation is like, mm -hmm. I put app blockers on my computer. Right. But I think the, the conversation we don't often have is about that leveraging mm -hmm. and like, you know, using the, the strengths and weirdnesses and, you know, of your own brain mm -hmm. to tell stories. So because we all have it, right? Absolutely. It, it's really just identifying and figuring out um, yeah. ways around it or ways through it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of Art, working artists, maybe you, you maybe see more extreme um, oh, yeah, neurodivergences probably. than like in like yeah. the CPA population. But who knows? I don't know. They're freaks. That's true. I don't know. Like really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's where the OCD people mostly are. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I have an accountant. Yeah. Um, okay, and then um, we have a couple of questions. So maybe this can be our last one, and then I'll end one with something maybe more general. But um, we have a couple of questions about outlining. Um, and I think we've kind of answered that in a sense for both of us, just that like there's this kind of very, you know, getting an overview of the story in different ways. But do you actually also outline? I don't. So the only time I've ever outlined is not really an outline, but um, for I, this story called um, Ghost and Empties, which was in Florida, yeah. um, I wrote it because I, w I kept going out at night angrily walking. And uh, I kept noticing things. And I was like, I need to write that for a story. So I would, I would put down the beats of what I had noticed almost in a list, and that's the only outline I've ever written. Amazing. Done. Do you ever do it retroactively? Like, as you're outlining, do you, like... Not intentionally. I mean, no. as you're revising. Yeah. No, no. Do you? No. I do. Yeah, I do. Um, I, tend, I tend to have a pretty loose outline when I'm drafting that's a little bit more... It's almost more for my own peace of mind, so that rather than feel like this is an endless thing that's going to last me for, you know a thousand pages mm -hmm. they're like oh no all I have left to do is this this and this mm -hmm. and it kind of makes it a little bit more manageable but it's not like a contract mm -hmm. with the book of like right. I have to do this now um and it is a way it's like an additional way of kind of going up of thinking about like getting I the aerial it's wonderful view if you can do it yeah yeah, yeah. But then what I when I tend to do it really meticulously is in revision where I need to go back and go, okay, what do I have here? What's redundant? What can I move around? Okay, I tend to use colors like that. So, Interesting. Yeah, so like I will, I will take the manuscripts. I think I'm just like a super visual person, and I will put, like if, if there's a character here and then there's not a lot of that character there, I will like flag where that character is with like stickies yeah. and sort of figure out through color that yeah. way. But that's, yeah. it's a different mode of outlining. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. I think sometimes you say outline. I always, like with my students, it's like I say outline and you can see who was traumatized in fifth grade yeah, language arts. True. Yeah. So they're like, and I'm like, no, I don't mean Roman numerals and capital. I, you don't have to like, I don't mean that. Just like, you know, can you draw it? I really can love you, that. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I don't even should, do it now. OCD, it really, really heaven. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, but like, yeah, it's like, can you draw it? Can you do a, track, a plot art? Can you like, what can you do to like back up? Mm -hmm. So you're not just looking at this much at a time on your computer screen and that's right. all the sense you have of what you're right. writing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you say that word and it, it absolutely, so people have the cold sweats. Um, all right, so, okay, the last thing I'm gonna ask you, um, is you've been uh, on book tour for like three weeks now? Who even knows? Something like that. What's my name? Yeah. I don't I know. even know. Okay. So uh, this is a general question because I, I would never assume that someone on a book tour is actively reading great literature at night when I they're like, am. okay, okay, good. So, gonna, so the question is, I'm going to ask you kind of, it's like, what are you reading and or watching and or just like finding joy in I right now? I have my list. Well, and I feel like I can't actually address this without my list. You I'm have your so list sorry. of like yeah. what you're reading. Yeah. You don't yeah. know what like like not what you're reading like at the moment. I don't mean like everything you've yeah, read. Yeah, no, so but far. I forgot the name of it. Oh. It's, it's this book by a German writer. Oh my gosh. Um, but I don't remember her name or the book's title. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. But it it's sounds really great. It's really good. Uh, what did I I read on the plane today? Um, Kate Zimbrino's um, The Light Room, and I like Kate Zimbrino's brain. It's yeah. really interesting. What else yeah. did I? Like, uh, I don't even, I'm so sorry. Oh, wait, I know. I read um, I, uh, audiobooks yesterday and today, um, Taft by Ann Patchett, Ooh. Uh, which is uh, one of the ones that I've never read of hers, so it, it was good to look at. Wait, Taft? T -A -S Taft, Taft like, like, like the president. Like the, the large president. Like the large president, yes. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know that one either. That's, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, 
Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. So you're staying, you're like, you're finding joy along the way. You're oh, staying. Oh, heck yes. You're in yeah. one piece. We're very excited well, about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, I don't know about that. But yes, yeah, so we're trying. We're trying yeah. really hard. We're doing yoga. Oh, yeah. We're doing that's... a lot of elliptical. Yeah. I'm eating a lot of meals of um, salmon, jerky, and pistachios which is actually a really very balanced meal. <laughs> it's quite good. I feel like someone out there should like take a note and just be like, okay, the, my takeaway is that the key to great writing, the, uh, salmon, jerky, and pistachios. The key to a book tour is having a foldable yoga mat. Oh, yeah. That is it. Yeah. That's, that's the only thing you need, yeah. other than underwear. Yeah. Foldable. Yeah. 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 I love it. Well, we are so glad that you're joining us. Um, we will both be out there um, with books. You can stop by and chat. And if you have a question that didn't get answered, if it's a quick one, um, as you're getting your book signed. Um, but enormous thanks to you, Thank first you. of all. Um <laughs> Um, enormous thanks to the Newberry Library. Um, please check out all of their programming. Check out Story Studios programming. And most importantly, come back to hear Hanif Abdurraqib and Jericho Brown. You're going to love those conversations. We are so excited for them. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.